have a rather thin class today. Um, I guess some people probably partied too hardy last night for Halloween. Um, that's okay. I don't care. Well, you know, I used to do that. I probably still will do that a few times in the term. Um, what I wanted to do to start off is sort of review uh, what I did last time, which was go through the uh, whole process of cellular respiration in, in this uh, figure and sort of emphasize what all the steps are and what happens, the inputs and outcomes of each of the steps. And of course, we start with glycolysis, that's a process of going from glucose, a six carbon molecule, to two pyruvates, which are three carbon molecules. Really what you want to do uh, as you go through these processes is not so much worry about a lot of the details, like where are the double bonds, where are the phosphates on these molecules. Keep track of the carbons and where they're going and how electrons are being pulled away, as is happening here, for example. In this process of going from glucose to pyruvate, you pull off uh, high energy electrons in the form of two and ADH molecules. You also produce two ATPs, a net of two ATPs. Okay, because there's actually an energy input phase, as we'll see. Um, the rest of the steps happen only if oxygen is present. If oxygen is present, then the pyruvates go into a grooming stage where they're made into acetyl-CoA. Basically, a carbon is broken off, and I'll show you figures of this process, so don't worry about it too much right now. But uh, the carbon is, uh, one of the carbons is broken off of each pyruvate. It's lost as carbon dioxide, but because that carbon is being broken off, there's electrons available to be placed into NADH. So we produce two NADHs out of this process and two acetyl-CoAs. The coenzyme A is there to get the, this stuff into the mitochondrion. It won't go in otherwise. And in fact, two ATPs are also used to get this stuff into the mitochondrion. Well, okay, so the acetyls, the acetyl-CoAs then go into the Krebs cycle, which happens in the matrix of the mitochondrion. And in that process, those two acetyl-CoAs are completely broken down into four carbon dioxides, six NADHs, two FADH2s, and two ATPs per glucose that went through glycolysis. So I'm still counting per glucose, per six carbons. Um, once that process has occurred, of course, the carbon dioxide is um, released and we exhale it. And all of those high energy electrons then go into electron transport, the ones that were produced in glycolysis, the ones produced in the grooming stage, and the ones from the Krebs cycle all go into electron transport, which produces a maximum of 34 ATP per glucose. Okay. Um, so overall, you get about uh, 36 to 38 ATPs per glucose, um, 38 for prokaryotes and 36 for eukaryotes because we have to transport stuff into the mitochondrion and prokaryotes, of course, don't have to do that. So they don't waste those two ATPs that we use. Um, if oxygen is absent, you can't do any of this. Um, you can't groom, you can't do Krebs cycle, you can't do electron transport. So you've got to do a different method to be able to regenerate the NAD plus that you've um, reduced in glycolysis. All right, so we go through fermentation. And the whole point of fermentation is to regenerate NAD plus so it can go back to glycolysis and break down and use, be used to break down another glucose and get ATP out. There's two types of, of um, <coughs> fermentation that occur depending on the cell type that you're looking at. Um, in uh, alcohol fermentation, you take the pyruvates, you break off a carbon dioxide, and in that process, you dump off a couple of electrons from NADH. So you get NAD plus again, um, and that produces ethanol. Right. The other process is lactate fermentation or lactic acid fermentation. There you're not breaking off any carbons. All you're doing is dumping off a couple of hydrogen ions and a couple of electrons to the pyruvate to produce lactic acid. Okay. That's what our muscle cells do when uh, they're working anaerobically. <coughs> all right, so glycolysis, grooming, Krebs cycle, electron transport, all of those happen when oxygen is present. Fermentation happens when oxygen is absent. So the thing to do now is to start looking in detail at each of these processes and ask what's really happening um, in order to break down this, gluc this glucose and get energy out of it. 
All right, so we move on to glycolysis, and it occurs in two stages. There's an energy input stage, and there's an energy payout stage. Okay, the reason that cells have to do the energy input is to get to the point where they can pull off a lot of the energy from that glucose molecule. It's like adding energy of activation in a sense. You have to build up the amount of energy in glucose so that you can pull more energy out of it. And um, I'll show you a figure that illustrates all of this. So our first stage is energy input for glycolysis. Um, what, we, what the cell does is it adds phosphates to glucose. And as you remember, adding phosphates to transfers the energy of the phosphate bond to that whatever molecule the phosphate is added to. So all the cell is doing is increasing the potential energy of that glucose molecule by adding phosphates to it. Okay, the glucose is then split into two three-carbon molecules. Okay, um, it actually turns out to be glyceraldehyde three phosphate rather than pyruvate. We do some rearrangements to get to the pyruvate. The stage, second stage is the energy payout, which occurs just after the glucose is split. That's when the cell is really able to start getting some energy payout. There's a huge initial drop in energy, uh, potential energy of these molecules when NADH is produced in the very next step after this um, splitting. Okay, so NADH is generated. Um, the bonds are then rearranged. There are several steps that rearrange the bonds in these three carbon molecules. Right, the only thing you have to worry about there, or remember, is that the cell is increasing the potential energy of that molecule by rearranging the bonds. Okay, it's increasing the potential energy of that mole those molecules by rearranging the bonds. Um, you don't have to worry about the names of those molecules. I'm not going to ask you those. You don't have to worry about the structure of them. You're not going to have to draw them or recognize them. Right? Know, though, why the cell does this. Okay, finally, ATP is generated um, not by electron transport, but by substrate level phosphorylation or substrate phosphorylation. It's that process that I showed uh, probably Monday it was, where that's two sessions ago, where um, we had um, an enzyme that takes an ADP, takes a phosphate from solution and sticks the phosphate onto ADP to regenerate ATP. Okay, so that's what we're looking at there. All right, um, so there's a figure in your book that shows glycolysis, and unfortunately when you print these out, um, it prints out the whole figure at once. I'm going to go through it in some stages. Okay, so here's the first three steps of glycolysis. All right, the first step is to phosphorylate or add a phosphate to glucose, producing a molecule called glucose 6-phosphate. Right, that's that first step in that figure. Um, that adds energy to glucose. In fact, you can chart the potential energy of these molecules, and there's a little jump in potential energy when you do that. Uh, the next step is to rearrange the glucose to produce fructose 6 phosphate. And the reason the cell does that is because there's another little jump in potential energy when that occurs. Okay, so all of these steps um, are adding potential energy to the molecule. That third step where you now use another ATP to put phosphates on either end of the molecule. You've increased the potential energy. So you've already used two ATPs in this process. You're two ATPs down, but you're going to get some more ATPs out, so it's not a big deal. All right, so ATP is used to energize glucose in these first, this first step. So there's already an energy deficit for the cell. Then the cell rearranges the glucose into fructose, which increases the potential energy of the molecule, makes it a little more unstable. All right, then another phosphate is added, and that increases potential energy again. All right, now here's where the split occurs. Boom. Step four, um, a six-carbon intermediate fructose 1,6-diphosphate is split into two three-carbon molecules, okay, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. 
The next step is where the energy payoff starts to happen. This step right here, step five, is the biggest uh, potential energy drop in this set of reactions because what we're doing is pulling high energy electrons off of these glyceraldehyde three phosphate molecules, these three carbon molecules. All right, we're reducing um, NAD and oxidizing the G3P. All right, then the next steps, whoops, the next steps are to um, rearrange these molecules. So we have more rearrangements. Here's a, here's a, a rearrangement with an energy payout, ATP produced. Okay, so we've already gotten back the two ATPs that we put in up here in the energy input stage. There's our first payout. We then do more rearrangements in steps seven and steps eight. There's a dehydration here, okay, um, which makes this molecule even more unstable. And it's very easy now to pull that phosphate off to produce two more ATP. It's exactly what the cell does. All right, so the final payout in all of these reactions is two net ATPs and two pyruvates and two NADHs. Okay, so what do you have to know about all of this? You don't have to know any of these names. I don't care if you know, remember these names. Okay? I don't usually remember them either. Here's what you need to remember. You're starting out with the glucose. You're putting in energy to get a bigger payout later. What is that energy payout? Well, the input is two ATPs. The output is four ATPs and two NADHs, okay, and pyruvates. Remember pyruvic acid here at the bottom, okay? So glucose to pyruvic acid with an input of two ATPs and an output of uh, four ATPs and two NADHs. Okay, so we've got our pyruvates. We're ready for the next step, which is the grooming stage. <coughs> Right. In the grooming stage, we generate CO2. Okay. We also generate NADH. All right. So we take pyruvic acid, we pop off a carbon as carbon dioxide. We take NADH in that step or NAD to produce NADH, so we're, st we're uh, skimming off a couple of high energy electrons, and we bind coenzyme A to this molecule to produce acetyl coenzyme A. Right? Two reasons the cell does this. Reason one, it generates NADH. Right? Reason two, this is the only way you get acetyl groups into the mitochondrion. You must attach coenzyme A to them. That's how the mitochondrion recognizes them and transports them in. Okay, so two reasons. Generates an ADH and you must transport acetyl groups in to the mitochondrion. In this process of grooming, to transport these acetyls into the mitochondrion, two ATPs are used. Right? That's very important to remember because that accounts for the difference in ATP production in prokaryotes versus eukaryotes like us. We use two ATPs to get that acetyl into the mitochondrion. It's actually the, um, the pyruvate that's being brought in. All right, so we've got our grooming step. We've got our carbons now in the matrix of the mitochondrion, and we're ready to do the Krebs cycle. Okay. Now, when you think of the Krebs cycle, it is a cycle right, in the sense that there are, um, there's a regeneration of the molecules that you start with. 
you have a certain molecule you start with, which happens to be oxaloacetic acid. You go through the reaction and you end up with what you started, oxaloacetic acid. But in that process, you, you take carbons, you break them down to carbon dioxide completely, and you, you uh, snatch off a whole bunch of high energy electrons from those carbons. Right? There's basically five steps. Acetyl-CoA enters. The coenzyme A is popped off. So the acetyl groups are then added to your starting material, which is oxaloacetic acid. That makes citric acid. That's why it's called the, um, the sometimes called the citric acid cycle or the TCA cycle. Okay, we generate NADH, CO2, and ATP in the second and third steps. And then it's just a matter of re arranging these molecules to get back where you started. But in that process, you get more NADH and you get some FADH2, which we haven't seen up to this point. It's one of those high energy electron carriers that I talked about. All right, so in step one, Acetyl CoA comes into the Krebs cycle. There is an enzyme that takes oxaloacetic acid and binds these two carbons to it, popping coenzyme A off in the process, which is unchanged. Um, it is now available to go back and bind to two more carbons. All right, so we've got two carbons that enter the cycle. They are attached to this oxaloacetic acid to produce citric acid. Okay, in the next two steps, what do we do? We pop a carbon off as carbon dioxide. In that process, because that carbon is, is being broken off, we're able to snatch two high energy electrons from it and form NADH. Um, that produces alpha ketoglutaric acid. And then we're able to form ATP with another carbon being broken off. At that point, right, at this point, step three in the cycle, we've gotten rid of all of those carbons from that glucose. They're all gone as carbon dioxide now. And there's nothing left of them. We've now got uh, another NADH that's produced, and we end up with a four carbon molecule, succinic acid. So all we've got to do now is get from succinic acid back to oxaloacetic acid. Those rearrangements that are done produce steps where you can uh, take high energy electrons out. And that's what happens in steps four and five. We get redox reactions that produce FADH2. In step five, we get a redox reaction that produces NADH. And in those two reactions, we regenerate oxaloacetic acid by going through malic acid. All right, so what do you need to know out of this reaction? You need to remember acetyl-CoA because that's the stuff that comes in. That's an input into the process. You need to remember how much NADH and FADH2 is produced. What we're doing here is looking through one turn of the cycle. If we were looking at what happens with a full glucose that went through glycolysis, we'd do two turns of the cycle. So in this reaction, what do we get out? We get uh, two, four, six NADHs, two ATPs, and two FADH2s per glucose, okay, per glucose. And we get CO2, four CO2s per glucose. The other two carbons of that glucose came out during the grooming step. Yes? Can you say again, like how many NADHs that work OK, well, let's think about this for a second. We've got um, half of our glucose here, right? The other half would have to come in and do another turn of the cycle, right? So all we have to do is double everything in here to see how much we get per glucose. So we get two ATPs, uh, two, four, six NADHs, and two FADH2s. Okay, so keep in mind, when you go through one turn of the Krebs cycle, you're actually 
looking at only half of the glucose molecule that went through glycolysis. All right, so in summary, four CO2s, six NADHs, two FADH2s, two ATPs for every glucose. And I don't expect you to remember all of those molecules in between, alpha-ketoglutaric acid, malic acid, oxaloacetic acid, eh, who cares? Now, if, if this was majors level biology, you'd have to remember those, but not here. Right? This figure shows you what you need to know about this um, cycle. Right? The other thing you need to remember about this cycle is why this cell does it. Right? Always ask yourself, why is this process occurring? What is the advantage for the cell? The advantage is that it gets energy payouts, ATPs, NADH, and FADH2, high energy electrons, which can then run through electron transport. Okay, so the whys are very important. All right, so what have we done? We've taken glucose, we've broken it down into pyruvate. We've groomed it to acetyl-CoA, sent the acetyl-CoA through the Krebs cycle, broken off all the carbons as carbon dioxide. All we have left of that um, glucose molecule, of the energy in that glucose molecule, is high energy electrons and some ATP. Right, we're now ready to get the big payout in the electron transport chain. All right, so by far, electron transport generates more ATP than any of these other processes. Um, the glycolysis steps generate two net ATPs. The Krebs cycle generates two ATPs. Electron transport generates 34 ATPs. So really, this is a huge energy payout for the cell. All right, it occurs in two major steps. There's a pumping step where electrons that are captured in prior stages are used to make a gradient of hydrogen ions. Right, now, think about where all this stuff is happening. Glycolysis is in the cytoplasm. Right? The pyruvate has to be transported into the mitochondrial matrix. That's where the Krebs cycle happens. The electron transport chain happens in the inner mitochondrial membrane. All right, so the pumping process that occurs here to pump hydrogen ions is actually pumping those ions into the space between the inner and the outer mitochondrial membrane, the intermembrane space. And this is why it's important to remember the architecture of these organelles, the chloroplast and the mitochondria, because it's important for function. All right, so those electrons that are captured, all those NADHs and FADH2s, those electrons are released, passed down an electron transport chain. That's used to pump hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space of the mitochondria. Eventually, the electrons are passed off to oxygen. So what do we got? We've released all that energy from those electrons in little steps, little bites, pumped hydrogen ions across the membrane. We now have energy in the form of a gradient, right? hydrogen ion gradient. If you allow that hydrogen ion gradient to dissipate, that is, you allow those ions to flow back through the membrane, you're going to be able to get energy out. That's exactly what happens. The hydrogen ions flow back through not just the membrane, but through the ATP synthase embedded in the membrane. All right? And as they flow through, the ATP synthase is able to take ADP and phosphate and stick them together to make ATP. All right, figure probably works better than words. And there's our figure. All right, look at what's happening in this process. We have our mitochondrial inner membrane here, this lipid bilayer. All of the proteins and other components of the electron transport chain are embedded in that membrane. The ATP synthase is also embedded in that membrane. All right, here's the process from left to right. We've got uh, NADHs and FADH2s that pass their electrons off to these electron carriers. 
All right, that regenerates NAD, and that stuff's now ready to go back to glycolysis and Krebs cycle and pick up more electrons. In the meantime, these electrons that have been passed off are passed from one carrier to the next. And what we're showing here in this slope of this line is that the ed potential energy is going down with every step. All right? So we have high potential energy here. We release a little bit of it, release a little on down the line. Every transfer releases a little bit more energy, which is used by these protein complexes to pump hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space. Right? So that's all we're doing. We're taking potential energy from electrons, converting it to potential energy in the form of a hydrogen ion gradient. Those electrons have got to go somewhere. They are passed off to oxygen, which with hydrogen ions produces water. So there's one of our outcomes of um, our uh, cellular respiration. OK, that's well and fine. We've, we've produced this gradient of hydrogen ions, but it's useless to us unless we can actually access that energy. So what the cell does is it allows those hydrogen ions to flow back through this protein this enzyme, ATP synthase. And as those hydrogen ions flow through, their energy is captured by ATP synthase, which takes ADP and a phosphate and makes ATP out of it. Okay? It's actually a fairly straightforward process. It's just chemical uh, or electromagnetic energy electrons converted to a gradient form of energy which is then converted to chemical energy. All you're seeing here is energy conversions. And this chemical energy, the ATP, is a form that the cell can then use. That ATP can be transported all over the cell to be used in whatever process it's needed for. Okay. So passage of electrons down that gradient generates hydrogen ions, uh, hydrogen ion gradient, which is then released to produce ATP. And that's where our big payout comes. <clears throat> um, it is possible, interestingly, to generate heat without making ATP. Babies are born with um, this specialized um, tissue called brown fat. And brown fat has lots of mitochondria in it that are um, well, they're, they're in a sense, they're hampered because they are unable to generate ATP. Instead, what they do is they take the lipids, break them down, and then use that energy to pump hydrogen ions across the membrane, just like regular mitochondria do. In this case, though, they don't make ATP. All they do is they let those hydrogen ions flow back through the membrane, and that generates heat. And that's how babies stay warm by using that brown fat. It's now also a reason why babies are born sort of, usually sort of pudgy, because they've got all that brown fat that they're going to be getting rid of over the next several months. All right, so you can generate heat without um, generating ATP. Um, you can do it pathologically, too, which I'll show you. It is possible to actually run this process in reverse and use ATP. Okay. So you should sort of think how that would happen. Um, it would have to, it would have to uh, be done with having a gradient on one side or the other of the membrane. Okay. Think of, because the ATP synthase is just a channel. Right? You can run that ATP synthase in reverse. So if you have a huge excess of hydrogen ions in the matrix of the mitochondrion, you'll actually run this process in reverse because those ions will flow the wrong direction through ATP synthase and break down ATP, which is kind of interesting. And again, you can create that situation pathologically. It's not normal. It is also possible to poison this process by using a number of different chemicals. In fact, um, there are several steps in the Krebs cycle and in glycolysis that can be uh, wrecked by various poisons. Um, and the next slide shows a few of these. Okay, rotenone is a very common uh, insecticide. It's a dangerous insecticide because it's dangerous to us too. Um, so you have to be careful with it. All right, so rotenone is, rotenone is a pesticide. And what it does is it blocks 
this first stage of electron transfer. Okay, it binds to this protein complex, blocks that electron transfer. So, of course, what happens is that you can't transfer electrons off from NADH. And this whole um, chemiosmotic system just grinds to a screeching halt. And if you can't make energy um, by cellular respiration, you're dead. Right, at least if you're um, most eukaryotes. Right. They're going to have a problem with it. Certainly, most multicellular organisms are going to have a problem with it. Okay, so you block that first step. Um, cyanide and carbon monoxide block this last step, passing off electrons to oxygen to produce water. Okay, carbon monoxide, it's pretty obvious how that would, that would work. Um, it builds up in your bloodstream so that the oxygen level drops way down, so you don't have enough oxygen to do this transfer. And the whole thing, again, grinds to a screeching halt. And it doesn't take very long before you feel the effects. Um, oligomycin is an antibiotic. And it blocks ATP synthase. So what happens is the cells pump hydrogen ions across the intermembrane space, and they can't get through this ATP synthase because the channel is blocked. Right? Pretty neat little system. Um, what happens is that the hydrogen ions build up to such a high level in the intermembrane space that they actually start leaking right through the membrane, and it generates heat. Right? And that's harmful to the cell as well. So oligomycin is a pretty effective antibiotic. Dinitrophenol is a leakage inducer. And all it does is it makes this membrane leaky to hydrogen ions. So the hydrogen ions are able to flow back across. So the cell is frantically um, breaking down glucose, generating NADH, pumping all those electrons through, and pumping hydrogen ions across the membrane. And then they just leak across again. And it generates huge amounts of heat. All of the energy in these electrons is lost as heat. Okay. Um, cells will use lipids to do this as well. Right? You'll start frantically breaking down lipids, trying to supply enough ATP for your cells to use. You might think that that'd be a great way to lose weight. Um, it is a great way to lose weight. It's also a great way to die. Okay. This is a, dinitrophenol was actually prescribed at one time for weight loss. Um, as were tapeworms. It's funny, at the, at the turn of the century, um, tapeworms were prescribed for weight loss. And there was thought that they had actually no ill effects. You see that the tur these turn of the century ads in magazines, for example, advertising tapeworms. Um, so dinitrophenol kills too easily because if you get too much, and it doesn't take much, um, you're going to generate too much heat. You're going to have a fever. That fever is going to get too high. You're going to start denaturing the proteins in your, in your cells. You're going to damage your neurons in your brain. Poof, that's it. Right? So you don't want to try this. Right? You don't want to get a hold of dinitrophenol and start taking it, thinking it's a miracle weight loss scheme, because it's not. Best weight loss program is still diet and exercise. Right? And as far as tapeworms go, it turns out that they alter your metabolism so you actually gain weight instead of lose weight. So that doesn't work too well either. And not to mention having a 20-foot you know, a, a tapeworm in your intestinal tract. I wouldn't want that. I'm told that you can actually feel them moving around inside your intestinal tract. Well, we'll talk more about this next term when we look at, uh, at an different groups of animals. Tapeworms are just cool. They are cool animals. <laughs> OK, here's our summary. This is everything that we've talked about. Uh, we, all we've done is go through the details. Now let's go back and look at the forest and ignore the trees for a minute. All right, glycolysis. We go from glucose to 2-pyruvic acids. We have Na2 NADHs that are produced um, and two ATPs. Right? Uh, two ATPs are used for shuttling these electrons made in glycolysis. You have to transport those across the membrane. Um, we get into the mitochondrial matrix with these acetyl-CoA's. They go in the Krebs cycle. We pop off a whole bunch of CO2's, and we get two ATP's. 
and a bunch of NADH and FADH2s. All of these NADHs and FADH2s are going into electron transport and chemiosmosis. That's where your big payoff is because that generates about 34 ATPs. We say about because other conditions may alter how much ATP you get per glucose. Um, if you're cold, for example, you're going to be generating more heat than glucose. And what, the cell, what cells can do is just let those ions flow back across without generating ATP. That warms you up because it generates heat. Um, so we say about 34 ATPs. It varies. So the maximum per glucose, if you're a prokaryote, is 38 ATPs. The maximum, if you are a eukaryote, is about 36, 34 to 36 ATPs. Okay, the reason is because of this step right here. We have to use two <laughs> ATPs to shuttle products from the grooming stage across the mitochondrial membrane. That's why we have a less ATP production than prokaryotes. OK, any questions on cellular respiration? So far. Good, OK. Fermentation. Um, we've looked in detail at what happens when you have oxygen available. Now we need to look at what happens if you don't have any oxygen. Um, it does have an impact on us because our muscle cells will do this. It has an impact on us as well because yeast cells will do this, and we wouldn't have beer and wine if we didn't have this fermentation process. Okay. So it, it makes a difference. If you can't have oxygen available, you can't do electron transport at all. It doesn't work because you don't have anything to pass the electrons off to at the end. That's why the oxygen is there. So a lot of cells can get by, at least for short periods of time, without oxygen. Some cells can get by for long periods of time without oxygen. Yeast cells are a good example. When you make that fermentative mix and you pump out all the oxygen, if you're trying to make home brew, for example, those yeast cells will stick around for a long time. Right. Um, so these cells that don't have oxygen have a fundamental problem. They have to get rid of those high energy electrons that they captured. They can't pass them off to anything. They've got to get rid of them. How do they do it? Well, they do it by fermentation. Okay, here is alcohol fermentation, which yeast do. What they do is they take these electrons and two hydrogen ions from NADH that are produced in glycolysis. Okay, those electrons are passed off to pyruvic acid. And in the process, they break off carbon as CO2. So one of those carbons is broken away from the pyruvate molecule. What's left after this um, reduction of the pyruvic acid is ethanol and CO2, of course. And if you're not pumping the CO2 out, then it sticks around and carbonates whatever fermentative beverage you're making. All right, so the, con the consequence is you generate CO2, you generate ethanol. Both of those are poisonous, but the ethanol is more poisonous than the CO2. Um, so ethanol is going to build up to a certain point in this, this mix, and it's going to kill the cells when it gets to a lethal level. And so you have an automatic um, cleaning mechanism for your homebrew. All right? It just kills all the yeast cells. So you don't have to worry about them. And so now you know how beer is made. And that's why we call alcohol beverages fermented. You can make them stronger by distilling off the ethanol and some of the other volatile stuff, which is kind of neat. That's how hard liquor is made. All right, so the other process that we have here is um, lactic acid fermentation. We don't do alcohol fermentation. As I say here, um, it would be really fun for a little bit of time, but then it'd be deadly. Right? As ethanol built up in our tissues, we'd die from alcohol poisoning. Um, in fact, I read that over uh, um, homecoming last weekend, there were two underage drinkers, by the way, who had to be taken to the hospital for alcohol poisoning. Right? You can die from this. Um, you got to be careful. All right, so what do we do? Our muscle cells make lactic acid. Um, so instead of making CO2 and ethanol, we just take pyruvic acid, 
drop off those electrons to the pyruvic acid and make lactic acid, which is just an isomer or a different form of pyruvic acid from it. Right? Um, lactic acid is also a poison. It's not quite as poisonous as ethanol, but it is a poison. So you've got to get rid of it. And this is one reason why you get cramps if you're doing anaerobic exercise, because your muscles aren't getting rid of the lactate as fast as it's being generated. Okay, so lactic acid fermentation, ethanol fermentation, two ways of dealing with a lack of oxygen. Um, some cells do uh, fermentation exclusively. There are some bacterial cells that cannot live if oxygen is present. Oxygen poisons them. So they do fermentation exclusively, and it's enough for their relatively limited needs. All right, now I've talked mostly about glucose going into these cycles, but there are other things that go in as well. Um, sugars, most sugars can come into the um, cellular respiration pathway just as sugars. You take polysaccharides, you break them down into monosaccharides, and you, f you shunt those into glycolysis. Most of those will be glucose. But you can bring fructose in as well, fruit sugar. Right? And actually, fruit sugar is better, you're better off because you can skip a step. Right? Fructose is the second molecule that's produced in uh, glycolysis. So you can skip a step. You don't have to convert glucose to fructose. But there are many other sugars that can be brought into this pathway. Uh, fatty acids are even better because you skip this pathway altogether. You take fatty acids, you break, their, the, break them apart into two carbon chains. Okay, and you shunt those in as acetyl-CoA. Um, amino acids, you have to pop the amino groups off. But once that's done, you can shunt them in at several steps. Here, uh, here is acetyl-CoA's um, into the Krebs cycle directly. Okay. Um, so there's lots of places where those things can come into these cycles. So you can use all of these food molecules as energy sources. The best energy source is this one right here, fatty acids. Okay. You get around 36 ATPs per glucose. You get around 120 or more ATPs per fatty acid. There's more carbons. There's more hydrogen ions. There's more high energy electrons. Okay. I mean, think about this. For every acetyl-CoA that goes through this cycle in electron transport, you're getting about 34 ATPs. So if you have a fatty acid that's 18 carbons in length, right, that's nine times you're able to get through all this, this uh, reaction. So 34 times nine, that's how many ATPs you get out of that one fatty acid. So no wonder our bodies store excess materials as fats, because it's a great energy source. And we might like, not like it so much, but our bodies certainly do. All right, so we will start Chapter 7 then in our next session, which is photosynthesis.